thanks so much, Hamid, uh, for introducing me. Thanks, everyone, for coming still on Saturday. It's an amazing conference. It's a pleasure for me to be here. This is joint work with Yeli from Ohio State University, who is unfortunately not here today. Beginning from 2008, the emergence of cryptocurrencies, in particular Bitcoin, heralded essentially a new era of digital payments. However, while these cryptocurrencies were initially intended to serve as a means of payment or or a store of value, the inventory high price volatility clearly limits these functions. A more recent trend related to cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology is the rise of decentralized finance. As the name already suggests, decentralized finance is financed without an intermediary. Decentralized finance offers a blockchain-based alternatives to brokerage, banking, exchanges, and so on. And the crucial thing is, that most of these DeFi activities require a blockchain-based safe asset that can function as a means of payment within the decentralized finance ecosystem. And stable coins rise to meet this growing demand for a blockchain-based safe asset. The upper two panels of this graph should give you an idea about the recent tremendous growth we have witnessed in decentralized finance and stable coins. The upper left panel depicts a measure of, the, of uh, decentralized lending activity, and the upper right panel depicts a measure of decentralized exchange usage, both of which are integral parts within the decentralized finance ecosystem. And the lower panel interestingly shows that simultaneous to the growth of decentralized finance, we have seen stable coins grow at similar pace. By today, stable coins have reached a market cap of about 180 billion US dollar. And the trend indicates further growth. So what are these stable coins? Stable coins are cryptocurrencies designed to minimize price volatility and packed to a reference unit, which is most of the time the US dollar. Typically, stable coins are issued by specialized stable coin providers. And these specialized stable coin providers can be centrally held companies like Tether, or decentralized autonomous organizations, so-called DAOs, like MakerDAO. And interestingly, in addition to that, we also see well-established networks of payment providers venture into stablecoin issuance too. I give two examples. One is JP Morgan, which is JP Morgan Coin. And another one is PayPal, a large payment provider, which announced recently that it want to, wants to venture into stablecoin issuance too. The crucial question in this context is, how do stablecoins maintain stability and in particular the peg to the US dollar? The most successful and least volatile stablecoins predominantly rely on reserves or collateral backing the stablecoin, which then allows for open market operations to stabilize the price. For instance, when the stablecoin price dips below the peg, the stablecoin issuer can use the reserve or the collateral to buy back stable coins to push up the price again back to the pack. In many cases, the reserves or collateral backing the stable coins are risky. To give an example, Tether, the largest stable coin, is backed predominantly by commercial papers of unknown quality and other highly volatile assets, including crypto assets, and only to a minor extent it is backed by cash or cash equivalent. In this context, we also see so called algorithmic stable coins which claim to employ some alternative or innovative stability mechanisms. But taking a close look at these algorithmic stablecoins, one sees that they're not so much different to the reserve-backed counterparts, in that they're typically backed by less reserves or riskier reserves. And in most of the cases, these reserves consist of their own governance token, equity token, so they're highly risky. In this space, we have also seen uh, or witnessed drastic failure. An example is like this year, uh, last year in June, uh, in June, we have seen the Iron Finance Bank run, where the stablecoin Iron Finance essentially failed. And that was an algorithmic stablecoin. So given the growing importance of stablecoins, we as financial economists need a framework that helps us think about stablecoins, and in particular, that helps us assess the stability or viability or fragility of certain stablecoin initiatives, especially if we talk about regulation. In this paper, we provide such a framework. 
With our model, we also rationalize many of the strategies we see stablecoin issuers employ in practice, and we give guidance for optimal implementation. These strategies include, but are not limited to, open market operations, the requirement of user collateral to back their stablecoin holdings, dynamic stability of transaction fees, a targeted price band within which the stablecoin price can float, or the issuance of so-called governance tokens that function as the stablecoin issuers' equity units. In this context, our framework can also be used to value these governance tokens behind many stablecoin initiatives, which is what practitioners are actually interested in. We also put particular emphasis to study and evaluate the stablecoin initiatives led by large networks or payment providers such as PayPal. In this context, we consider that the stablecoin issuer collects and utilizes transaction data brought up, brought up by stablecoin usage, and we ask whether this is a good thing or whether privacy regulation should preclude such data collection. And finally, we use our model to derive some implications for regulation of stablecoins, and this way we contribute to an ongoing policy debate. So let me give, at this point, some context, some overview about the model we consider. We develop a dynamic model in which stablecoins are issued by a financially constrained stablecoin issuer, which we call the platform. The issue is financially constrained in a sense that um, raising new financing by issuing equity to outsiders is costly or not possible. The stablecoins offer a convenience yield and are therefore bought by risk averse users. Why are the users risk averse? Well, the risk aversion will simply reflect that they value price stability or more broadly that price stability is a desirable feature of any transaction medium. The platform maximizes its equity value or equivalently the value of its governance tokens. And in order to do so, it dynamically manages reserve assets, transactional user fees, and importantly, the stablecoin supply by engaging in open market operations. The first result is that we show that the platform strategies and in particular the stability of the stablecoin can be characterized by the platform's excess reserve C which is the difference between the reserve assets and the dollar value of outstanding stable coins. Notice that C positive means essentially that the stable coin is over collateralized and C negative means that the stable coin is under collateralized. When the excess reserve C are large, the stable coin undergoes a virtuous cycle. Under these circumstances, there is no price volatility. The price is at its peak and there are low transaction fees which stimulates user usage, which stimulates demand for the stable coins, and importantly also stimulates the revenues the issuer earns. As such, the issuer's reserves grow further, and this further stabilizes the stable coin, thereby leading to some virtuous cycle. In contrast, when the excess reserves C are low, there is a vicious cycle. Under these circumstances, price volatility rises, the price falls below the pack, Transaction fees are high, and this exerts downward pressure on the demand for the stablecoin and on the stablecoin issuers' reserves, which in turn further exacerbates instability and so on. And once the stablecoin issuers' reserves may drop negative, there's the possibility of a run that can trigger liquidation. In this context, we document an instability trap. Stability lasts for most of the time. However, once the stablecoin breaks the pack, the price falls below the pack and price volatility spikes, the recovery back to the stability regime is slow. The growing market cap and importance of stablecoins has also attracted enormous attention from regulators and policymakers. To give two examples of that, on the 1st of November 2021, US Treasury released a report on stablecoins, also outlining potential regulation. After that, on the 14th of December, 2021, the US Senate held a hearing about the risks and benefits of stable coins. We would like to contribute to this policy debate and therefore use our model to assess and evaluate certain regulatory proposals. In particular, our model recommends that a capital or reserve requirement for the issuer is beneficial in that it makes the stable coin also more stable. You might think this is like a standard result from the banking literature, but the next one might be not. In particular, restricting 
the riskiness of the reserve assets that the issuer holds can have the opposite effect and destabilize the stable coin. In this context, we document a volatility paradox. If the regulator requires the issuer to hold safe assets or safer assets as reserves, the issuer responds and simply holds less reserves, which can actually exacerbate instability and fragility. And finally, we show that a privacy requirement or regulation that restricts the stable issuer from collecting transaction data can actually have the unintended benefit of also stabilizing the stable coin next to other obvious benefits, as I think that's Michael Stockin's papers. So at this point, let me go into the model. The model is set up in continuous time and has an infinite horizon. There's a continuum of users and they apply a discount rate R. Users demand stable coins for transactions and stable coins, or which we refer to as tokens, have an endogenous price P with drift mu P and volatility sigma P. At this point, we don't even say anything that the stable coin is stable. That will be an uh, optimality outcome. And the stable coin in particular will be stable when DP in equation one will be equal to zero, in particular implying that sigma P, the volatility of the stable coin, our key variable of interest will be equal to zero. And there are some shocks. There's some uncertainty, and this may be shocks to the issuer's reserves, which we'll discuss later in more detail, but it simply captures that the reserve assets are risky or that the issuer has some operational costs or losses which she can incur. Importantly, the users can trade the stable coin without friction at price PT among themselves or against the platform. And this includes the possibility that the users redeem. Yeah, the users can sell the stable coin at price PT to the platform, which is simply a key to redeeming, which we see in many stable coin initiatives. And lastly, the platform manages the token supply and in particular can always mint new tokens, in which case the supply ST expands, or the platform can buy back tokens from the users, in which case the supply ST contracts. Why are stablecoins used in the model? Stablecoins offer a convenience yield. To model this convenience yield, we denote by UIT the dollar value of any user I's token holdings at time T, and dollars will be the number rare throughout our analysis. And if the users hold these UIT dollars and tokens, they derive some instantaneous payoff in equation two. And there's a convenience yield. Sorry for the, um, uh, want to say sorry to the discussion at this point, we removed some network effects, which were entering the convenience field prior to that. And in addition, the instantaneous payoff of the user also increases with potential token returns, but falls with the opportunity cost of holding tokens, which is simply the interest rate R, and the fees the platform levies to the users, FT. And in addition to that, the last term captures that the users have some preference for price stability, in that the utility they derive decreases with the volatility of the stable coin. And this price stability parameter can be, in, uh, can be set as you desire. If you set it sufficiently large, then there will be no volatility except in certain, in certain circumstances. And the users optimize over their stablecoin holdings without showing the detailed problem or the optimization. This leads them to a demand for stablecoins denoted NT in equation three. And the most important thing is essentially this demand for stablecoins simply decreases with the price volatility. That is decreases with the instability of the stablecoin. If the stablecoin becomes unstable, the users respond and just switch maybe to another stablecoin, but simply do not hold the stablecoin anymore. And for technical reasons, there's imposed an upper bound on the transactions or the uh, stablecoin demand, which is kind of related to Thomas' paper, like the blockchain or the stablecoin might not be infinitely scalable. There's a limit on the amount of transactions it can handle. So let us discuss the platform's problem. The platform holds reserve assets MT that back the stable coins. And these reserve assets grow with the interest earnings at rate R. They grow with the proceeds from issuing new tokens, the second term, which can actually be negative if the platform buys back tokens. They grow with the fee revenues because the platform charges fees to the users. And importantly, the reserve assets are exposed to some exogenous shocks, some Brownian shocks in this case. And these shocks scale with the out a number of outstanding stable coins, NT. And as I said, these shocks capture the reserves are risky, or they could also capture that the platform simply incurs some operational losses. 
And finally, the platform pays its owners dividends out of its reserves, so the reserve assets for the dividend payouts. We assume these dividends payouts must be positive, reflecting that the platform owners are protected by limited liability, and in the extreme case that issuing new equity is not possible, which we relax later, not in this presentation. So lastly, what does the platform do? The platform maximizes the expected discounted value of its dividends, that is, the value of its equity, or in crypto terms, often the value of its governance tokens. So let me characterize the equilibrium before going into the result. In equilibrium, the market for stable coins has to clear. What does it mean? On the left-hand side of this market clearing condition six, the demand for stable coins NT in US dollars must equal the supply for stable coins ST times PT in dollars. So what do we have to keep track of if we start for this dynamic equilibrium? We have to keep track of the platform assets or reserves MT, and we have to keep track of the platform liabilities that is the stable coins outstanding, ST times PT. And this leads us actually then to define the difference between these two, the excess reserve CT, which is the platform reserve assets minus the platform liabilities, MT minus ST times PT. And as we show in equilibrium, CT, the platform's excess reserves is the only state variable. And importantly, it has a nice interpretation because when CT, the excess reserves are positive, the platform is over collateralized. Why is this important? When the platform is over collateralized, they cannot be a run. Even if all users decide to essentially sell the stablecoin holdings or to redeem the stablecoins, the platform has enough reserves to meet these requests, to meet these redemption requests, and can actually stabilize or defend the exchange rate. In contrast, when C is negative, we have under collateralization. In this case, the platform could not defend the exchange rate. If all users were to sell their stablecoin holdings, the price necessarily would drop. In particular, there's the possibility of a run, which could cause the failure of the stablecoin, as we have witnessed in practice in the example of Iron Finance. To capture the potential hazards, risks, or in particular the costs of a run on the stablecoins, we assume that the platform becomes under collateralized, uh, the platform becomes liquidated when it is under collateralized possibly reflecting a run. How do we motivate this? Well, essentially the users follow a threshold strategy. When the users observe that the platform access reserves are sufficiently low, they decide to run on the stable coin. We show them that actually the only equilibrium threshold for a run can be actually at C equals zero. Why is that? Well, the platform is under collateralized or strict and C is negative and there's a run, then users would lose something on the run. Some users would end up empty, uh, would end up empty-handed. So these users would essentially front run and run just before C reaches C lower bar. So facing the risk of liquidation, the platform essentially cannot always maintain exchange rate or price stability. In particular, as a result, we obtain in equilibrium both a stability and instability region. When the excess reserves are sufficiently high, we have the stability region. There's no price volatility and the transaction volume is sufficiently high. In contrast, when there are negative shocks to the platform issuer's reserves that wipe out these reserves, then the stablecoin becomes unstable and we are in the instability region. How does this graphically look? The price is stable and there's no price volatility when the excess reserves C are large, which is shown in the left panel. However, once the excess of C fall below a critical threshold, denoted by the dashed red line, the stable coin becomes unstable, price volatility rises. In particular, this price volatility decreases with the platform's excess reserves. As I said, the users do not like it when the stable coin is unstable. In that sense, users essentially decrease the demand for the stable coin when the stable coin becomes unstable, which is what we see. In this case, the token usage or the demand for the stablecoin increases with the platform's excess reserves. In contrast, the transaction fees, they decrease with the excess reserves. In particular, the transaction fees can become negative when the excess reserves are sufficiently high, in which case essentially a platform subsidizes the demand or the usage for the stablecoins and the stablecoin users eventually can earn some interest by holding the stablecoin. So how does this look? How does the stablecoin price move? 
The middle panel depicts the stablecoin price as a function of the platform's access reserves. The price, this is its peg of $1 when the access reserves are sufficiently high. Again, when there are negative shocks to the excess reserves, wiping them out, then there is price volatility and the stablecoin price drops below its peg. Depending on the parameter, it drops sufficiently low. Then we have, for instance, uh, high stability preference, then the price can actually even drop to zero. So in this case, a numerical example, it is not the case. Interestingly, the right panel shows how the platform optimally should manage the supply of the stablecoin, thereby giving guidance for optimal open market operation. In this context, the model shows that when the platform's reserves are sufficiently high, there's not much scope for, access for open market operation. The platform can essentially remain passive on the sideline. However, it waits until a certain point when the access reserves become lower and are in an intermediate region, the platform essentially withstands negative shocks in order to stabilize the price. When there's a negative shock, there's downward pressure to the price. What does the platform do? It uses its reserves to buy back the stablecoin to withstand this downward pressure to move the price back to the peg. Until a certain point, when the reserves are sufficiently low and the platform faces the risk of imminent liquidation, the platform can no more stabilize the stablecoin price. In this case, it acts the opposite. When there's a negative shock, it doesn't buy back the stablecoins, it actually issues more stablecoins in the hope to be able to replenish its reserves. And this further exacerbates the instability. That's why we get a such um, pronounced instability regimes. This graph essentially depicts the dynamics of the stablecoin in a simulation. The interesting uh, panel is panel B depicting a token price. As we see here, token price remains stable for most of the time, but then at some point it breaks the buck. And then this instability regime persists and it takes in this graph around five periods to recover again back to the fixed exchange rate regime. But this is just illustrative. We also show that this same result is present when we model or simulate the stationary density of states. We show that this distribution is essentially bimodal. What does it mean? Most of the time, we are in the stability regime close to the, uh, to the when, when excess reserves are large. But there's also a large probability mass in the instability region to the left of the solid black line in particular near to zero. How do we interpret this? Well, stability lasts for most of the time, but once the stablecoin breaks the buck and debasement occurs, price stability rises, the recovery back to the fixed exchange rate regime, stability region is slow, possibly never possible. At this point, we can talk about regulation. We can use our model to assess several regulatory proposals. The first is a standard capital requirement inspired from the banking literature. What does such a capital or a surf requirement do? Well, it requires the issuer essentially to maintain a minimal buffer. We showed that such a capital requirement is essentially beneficial in that it increases the uh, reserves the issuer maintains and so therefore increases the stability of the state of coin. On the other hand, it's a regulatory cost borne by the platform. So the platform essentially suffers from having to apply, comply to a capital requirement. Nevertheless, we show that a well-designed capital requirement can actually improve total welfare, which is shown in the last uh, panel D, that there is a hump-shaped, the curve is hump-shaped, so there's interior optimum. At this point, I would like to contact the convincing that restricting the issue to hold safe assets or less risky assets can actually destabilize the state of coin. To do so, we assume now that the reserve assets also earn some endogenous return new hat and are exposed to some volatility sigma hat, which is the last term essentially in this law of motion in the dynamics of the excess reserves. How do we specify it? How are this uh, mu hat and sigma hat for the return and the volatility related? Well, we assume a constant sharp ratio essentially. And actually the dotted red line assumes that there is sharp ratio zero. So an increase in sigma hat doesn't increase the returns, it just makes the whole thing more risky. And then we look at two measures of st price stability. One is the probability that the stable coin is its peg, the other one is the average price volatility. And as we increase the token price risk or the volatility sigma hat, the risk of the reserves, the stable coin becomes actually more stable. Why is that? Well, 
The issuer essentially becomes less bold, maintains more reserves to buffer these shocks. Conversely, restricting the issuer to hold low volatility assets can actually destabilize the stablecoin because the issuer just holds less reserves. Let me conclude at this point. In this paper, we develop a dynamic model of stablecoins, which is one form of shadow banking or crypto shadow banking. We show that despite over collateralization, there can be fragility and we demonstrate an instability trap. Stability lasts for most of the time, but once the stablecoin becomes unstable, recovery back to the stability regime is slow. We rationalize several stability mechanisms we observe in practice, and our model can be used to assess regulatory proposals. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me, and I'm looking forward to good discussion and to great. Um, thanks so much for the chance to discuss this paper. Um, it's on a very important topic. I'm sure everybody in this room has spent a lot of time thinking about stable coins. I hardly need to motivate why this is an important topic to think about. Um, so what this paper does is specifies a very rich dynamic model of the management of a stable coin by a platform. Um, I want to compliment right away the, the, the paper itself because the model is very rich. There's a lot going on and a lot of interesting behavior comes out in equilibrium. Um, but when you read the paper, it's extremely transparent about every piece that's going into the model and exactly why things work the way they do. So despite the richness of everything that's going on, I felt like after just one read through the paper, I understood very clearly why the model works the way it does. And also a lot of connections, um, like any good crypto paper, you feel like if you look at it one way, you can see a model of corporate finance from a different perspective, a model of sovereign debt from a different perspective, manufacturing safe assets. It is not easy to write a paper where all those things are clear. I thought it was very clear in this paper, so I want to compliment the authors on that. Um, so because the, the paper is quite clear about what it does, um, as a discussant, I'm in a position where what I want to do is just take a step back and think about things on a very intuitive level why some of the modeling choices that are made lead to some of the results that we see and just how to position that and think about it um, in the context of like what types of projects would this apply to and so forth. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just quickly recap, um, not in a lot of detail, but just in a very high level, um, the modeling ingredients and why they work the way they do. Also to be clear about how I understood the paper from reading it, because I think that it's kind of a, it's a moving target a little bit and some things may have changed slightly from, from, the, from the version that I read. So the platform side is going to be um, kind of like a, a model that sounds pretty familiar. This is a platform that's gonna maximize um, discounted values of payouts to governance tokens, which really are equivalent to equity in this type of a model. Um, how is it gonna do it? It's gonna sell tokens to users. The proceeds are gonna be put, placed into reserves that will back the, the stable coin. And then the platform is gonna charge transaction fees to users who wanna use, um, use these tokens. Now, when the platform's net worth, um, which is equivalent to its excess reserves, fall to zero, there's going to be liquidation. That liquidation is costly in the sense that the value function goes to zero, but if liquidation didn't happen, the value function would be positive. So some value is destroyed there. It's valuable to everybody to avoid that liquidation state. Um, that is going to drive some of the platform's behavior. It's going to hold reserves to try to avoid the liquidation state, but not too much because users discount um, reserves that are tied up inside the platform. So that's going to keep the platform trying to manage its reserves in sort of the right region. I want to say that um, in the main paper, as far as I understood it, the, the liquidation policy is actually quite strict, that if reserves fall to zero, the platform will be liquidated for zero value. There's a little bit of discussion about what would happen um, if equity could fall to negative values, which would lead to run type of equilibria. But for the most part, I think in the, in the results that are presented, um, the, the liquidation policy is as I'm describing it here. So the, the platform is going to collect fees from um, users using the tokens, and that's going to be helpful to replenish reserves in case there are negative shocks to net worth. And that's how the platform is going to stay recapitalized um, when necessary. On the user side, there's going to be a direct utility from using the tokens that makes these um, transaction valuable tokens. There's also a direct utility for low volatility of the token price. That's what makes this a model of stable coins. And it's going to be endogenous behavior then that the platform does deliver a, a coin that is stable most of the time, but not always. There are times when it's optimal to sort of destabilize the coin to some extent. Also, there's going to be a network effect um, in that the utility users get from the token increases in aggregate holdings of the token. I'm going to say a few words about it, and, and I want to be actually very clear about what that's doing in the model right now. Um, uh, and, and I'll be clear about that as I go through it. So keep in mind, there is this network effect in the results as we're presenting them now. Okay, so what happens in equilibrium? Um, because of the network effect, there is a trivial equilibrium where nothing happens at all. We're going to mostly ignore that in the paper, but I do want to keep it in the back of our head. I'll come back to it later on. So because of the network effect, there is an equilibrium where just no one uses the platform at all. We're going to ignore that and focus on the Pareto dominant equilibrium where people do use the platform. Um, what there is not, as far as I understood it in the paper, is a bank fund equilibrium because we constrain that net worth can actually negative, ne never go to negative value. So it's, this is a pretty important issue. Um, as I understand it, 
the ever is common knowledge that the platform's net worth is always going to be at least zero, and therefore there's not actually a run happening in equilibrium in the results um, as they're presented. What happens in the Pareto dominant equilibrium where people use the platform? The price is fixed most of the time. That's endogenous because users want a stable price. That's in their utility function. But if reserves deteriorate low enough, it's optimal for the platform to temporarily abandon that pit peg, start issuing more tokens, collecting more fees, and slowly recapitalize by building that up on its balance sheet. Very natural. One conclusion out of this is even though it's known that the platform has non-negative net worth, nevertheless, that does not guarantee that the stable coin will be always stable, which I think is an interesting and actually pretty important result to think about. There's this intuition that um, a, 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 a platform with positive net worth would always be able to and would always choose to maintain a fully stable token price that's not coming out of the model, and that's interesting. Um, to be clear, it's not bad for token holders because if you try to take that option away by regulation, the paper shows that you're actually making things even worse. It is optimal for everyone if the platform every now and then can deviate from stability, recapitalize, and then go back to its, its peg. Okay, so, and, and in the end, the peg state is actually quite stable in the steady state. Network effects help with that. They are not critical to it. And so the, the paper can shut that down and still get the, um, still get what it wants. Okay, so in the long run steady state, you have a possibility of drifting down to, to low net worth, but also most of the time the platform is gonna be staying at high values of net worth. And the vast majority of the time, the, the token price is gonna be endogenously stable as the users want. Okay, so that's kind of like the most important results in the paper. Now, there is a lot in the paper on network effects. And again, just to be clear, I'm going to suggest that the paper take network effects out. It looks like they're already moving in that direction. But just to be clear, some of the results that were presented are clearly a calibration with network effects. And I'll be able to tell you why that is and why it's important to thinking about what we see so far. So alpha here on the horizontal axis is the degree of network effects. As it gets bigger, that strategic complementarity is bigger. As alpha goes to zero, the strategic complementarity goes away. Um, but what I want to focus on is that alpha causes, so higher network effects cause the probability of maintaining the peg to increase. And there's kind of this natural complementarity. Once you've drawn people in, more people come in, reserves get bigger, um, coin becomes more stable. But it's not critical. Even if you shut down alpha completely, you can still get that the, most of the time, the coin will maintain its stability. Um, also, total welfare on this platform is increasing in the degree of network effects, which is also interesting due to that, that complementarity um, that I'm talking about. Okay, so a few comments. I'm just going to have a few to, to make here. Number one, about this liquidation and recapitalization um, policy and issue. So what types of projects are we really thinking about here? Um, it is quite important in the model that liquidation is socially costly, and the platform is going to avoid it by recapitalizing from fee revenue um, whenever its net worth falls too low. However, the paper is often mentioning um, and sort of like loosely motivating its analysis from stable coins that would be issued by large entities, um, like Facebook, Simon mentioned PayPal and other things. Would they face difficulty recapitalizing a platform if necessary? Um, would they face difficulty avoiding costly liquidation? The, the point of liquidation is that people want the platform to continue, but it's going to shut down because its net worth fell too far. I would think a large entity would be able to recapitalize in that case. Um, might affect the, the, the way we think about the, the, what types of platforms these results should apply to. To me, the most natural setting for the paper's analysis is actually sort of a small standalone, not small, but a standalone stable coin that does not have a large entity behind it might be something worth thinking about. Um, another way to approach this, the paper does have an extension where the platform can issue equities. The authors have thought about this. Simon didn't have time to present it. Um, they, they put in some of the standard equity issuance costs. Um, but there isn't a lot in that section. And for the most part, what it shows is that if the costs are big, then the model kind of looks similar to the model without equity issuance at all. I would like that to be developed a little bit more. Um, what would be interesting is to see comparative statics with those equity issuance cost parameters. My intuition is that as equity issuance becomes costless in the limit, the debasement behavior that the, that the paper is focusing on would start to go away. Because if you have access to cheap equity capital, you would rather recapitalize that way rather than with the fee transaction. So not a problem, but if true, it would help us to understand what's really important here. I believe avoiding liquidation is an important driver of a lot of what's going on in the paper, and therefore that should sort of dictate what types of projects we have in mind here. Um, okay. Second, about network effects. So um, as Simon mentioned, they're kind of on the way out of the paper, I think. Um, they're useful in the paper because they do amplify some of the results. For example, the coin is more stable as network effects grow, which I already showed you. Um, however, they're not critical. So even if you take network effects out, you will still get that stability. There's a problem in some of what the paper is trying to do in the presence of network effects. The biggest one is that they lead to this multiplicity of equilibria. So just like most papers in this literature, the paper is not worried about the failure sort of trivial equilibrium and is mostly characterizing the good equilibrium, and that's understandable. 
But when we start doing welfare and policy analysis, I get a little bit uncomfortable with the fact that we're just ignoring um, this other equilibrium that can happen. For example, the paper show, it shows us that a capital requirement can increase welfare, which is very interesting. Like how often do you find that it's such a simple regulation can clearly increase welfare? But it's always in the good equilibrium. Is it possibly affecting the probability of also being in that equilibrium in the first place? It's not clear to me. Um, to really make this totally, uh, totally rigorous, as far as I know, you'd have to really take a stand on how you're selecting between the two equilibria in the model. I think that's a very interesting topic. Maybe I'm biased. But I think it's also not exactly the focus that the paper wants. So my suggestion would be, and it looks like the authors are kind of going in this direction already, shut down the network effect in the main model, set alpha equal to zero. Still very interesting to have it as an extension and show how it's amplifying things, not critical to the core message that the paper is trying to show. However, I want to say, this could be good or bad, for better or for worse. It's also going to make the policy analysis much um, simpler in a way. Alpha, the network effect, is also the key externality in the model. If you shut it down, it's not so clear to me that there's any kind of market failure and therefore not any clear role for regulation. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe there's something else, but as far as I can tell, um, alpha being positive is the only reason why we might get benefits from regulation in this model. If you take it away, we kind of know already how the story is going to go, that regulations can kind of only hurt um, the welfare on this platform. And now, if that's true, that's not necessarily a problem. I think there's still a lot of value in writing down a model where we know regulation is going to hurt things, but still kind of say exactly why that happens. And some of the paper's results do fit that narrative, but it is kind of a trade-off of taking away the network effects if you go that direction. To be clear about what I'm trying to say here, okay, so here's alpha, the network effect, in the paper's um, analysis. You can take alpha all the way to zero. It's not on the axis here, but the, the probability of a peg is still very high. So it doesn't remove the stability result that the paper is talking about. But you do remember that um, one thing you saw in the presentation was this inverse U shape of total welfare as a function of a capital requirement that the regulator could impose. So that would imply there's this optimal capital requirement that maximizes welfare, which is very interesting to me. This figure is going to plot that optimal capital requirement as a function of the network effect. And we can see very clearly as the network effect disappears from the model, that capital requirement goes to zero. Suggests to me that the policy analysis, like I said, will be sort of more immediately clear that the, the regulation is not going to help if there's no network effect in place. So in the presentation we saw just now, the, the, that result was contingent on network effects. Being there, you take them out of the model, I think you're going to have the, that, that, that it's harder for a regulator to improve things, unless there's some other externality going on, in which case that should be a bigger, um, bigger focus in the paper. Okay, um, last few minutes I have. So the paper has a very interesting extension. Simon didn't have much time to, to talk about it, but I think it's actually quite interesting, where um, the platform is going to benefit directly from... Um, the information that it gathers from users on the platform or in, in sort of a reduced form way that just the platform has this additional revenue stream coming from um, or sort of the profitability of transactions is affected by the amount of transactions that it has. The key result from that from that section is, is intuitive. I'm just going to state it here without writing out the model. Um, the token price actually becomes less stable. The stability of the stable coin is less uh, less 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 reliable if this is a coin that can profit from users' data. Why is that? Because now the platform has an additional revenue stream, um, and if it, if it has the source, if it has the ability to profit in that way, it's going to lean heavily in that direction. What it will do is slash fees on the platform and realize lower fee revenue, but in doing so, realize greater transaction volume and therefore more profits from the data that it's collecting. Actually, a very intuitive and interesting kind of result. Now, the trade-off the paper is highlighting is that when it does that, because it's collecting lower fees, that means it's also going to be recapitalizing slower after negative shocks to its net worth. And that in turn is what makes it less reliable that the coin will be stable. So that's the mechanism I'll start to finish as I understand it. Very interesting. Number one, that again highlights that it's very important here that this platform, um, if it gets liquidated, that's socially costly and the platform has no way to recapitalize other than collecting fees. Because if there's some bigger entity behind it that can recapitalize when necessary, this feels like less of a concern. So again, I would say that kind of like we have to think about um, exactly what types of projects do we have in mind here. If this is a plat if this is a coin issued by the kind of big platforms, big tech platforms that, that seem likely to have access to lots of valuable data, then I wonder how important the, the liquidation policy is. Second, just a basic confusion. If the platform is collecting extra profits from its data, why can't it use those profits to recapitalize? When I didn't quite get that. Maybe I'm missing, missing something basic. Last thing I would say, this is being a little bit picky because the paper is careful about its wording here, but Sometimes it sounds like the paper is, is presenting this result as a suggestion to regulate um, privacy, um, to, to prevent stable coins from collecting this kind of data. 
But to be clear, we're not saying that that would improve welfare in this case because users are getting lower fees. And in some sense, users are rationally choosing to use the coin in this situation, despite the fact that they know it's collecting this data about them and profiting from it. Um, rather, it's just a, the, the, the more sort of literal fact that a regulation could increase stability. It's not so clear that stability is inherently desirable here. The paper is careful about it. I just want to be clear that that's the right way to think about the result. Um, and Simon was careful about it in the talk just now. So those are a few comments. Like I said, I was able to keep it very high level. That there's nothing about the execution of the model itself that, that one can criticize. I think it's all quite clear. I have some other smaller comments. I'll just quickly maybe uh, mention one of them. At the top here, um, one, of the, one of the reasons why I think people often think about trying to regulate stable coins is that we're concerned about monitoring the existence of the reserves themselves, making sure they're still there or invested in the right stuff. That's not really coming up in the model. I think, I think because it's not so much that users can directly monitor the reserves, but rather that users don't really have to worry about it because everyone knows that if the platform hit ne zero negative worth, um, zero net worth, the platform would be liquidated and the platform is gonna try to avoid that. Therefore users just, all they need to do is observe the volatility of the token price itself. So I don't think you should try to model it, but it seems important to acknowledge that they may be the reason in practice that people think about this stuff. It's not really present in the model. Um, the rest is easier to talk about offline. And so I'll just hand it over to Simon at this point and say thanks again for the chance to discuss a very interesting paper.